spend time on this. Let me, let me give you a conundrum. In 1950, the highest median income household in the United States was in Detroit. And the city of Detroit had 1,800,000 people. Last year, Detroit had shrunk to 950,000. From 1,800,000, ,000, they had shrunk to 950,000, and they had dropped from the highest median income in the country to being 66th. It was almost all because of bad policies. If you raise taxes, if you don't have an effective police force, if the neighborhood is dangerous, if the schools don't succeed, if it is so expensive and there's so much red tape that businesses will not come, you collapse. Now this is not, I mean, this should be self-evident, but it's not because people say, well, that can't be the reason. I mean, after all, that would mean you want less government, less bureaucracy, lower taxes, you want physical safety. Well, those can't be the answers because if those were the answers, that wouldn't fit my ideology. So let, let me give you a couple case studies you can all go look at. 1960, South Korea and Ghana are the same per capita income. Today, South Korea is the 11th wealthiest country in the world, a center of high technology and stunningly entrepreneurial and aggressive and in the world market. Forty years ago, the biggest export of Ireland was its children. Ireland had been historically the poorest country in Western Europe, and they couldn't create enough jobs, and their young men and women left the country to go find work elsewhere. Today, after a policy of low taxes, welcoming foreign investment, infrastructure development of roads and water, et cetera, and fundamentally overhauling their education system so it actually worked. They are a higher income per capita than Germany. They are projected by the Bundesbank to be the second wealthiest country in the world by 2030 per person. And they have 50,000 guest workers from Eastern Europe. Now, this is the world that works. If you want to see an example of this, you can go to YouTube where I have a little three and a half minute package called FedEx versus Federal Bureaucracy. This is the world that works. This is the world that fails. Zimbabwe fails. Cuba fails. These are, these are systems of government that destroy their own people. And while the Chinese are still a dictatorship, their shift to a free market system in the 1990s fundamentally changed the trajectory of, science, of Chinese history and has fundamentally enriched the Chinese people. So, if you, so it's not a technology issue. It's, it's an issue of governance and it's an issue of, of, of predatory politicians prepared to destroy their own people for their own selfish interest. And I think until we're honest about that, you're not going to fix sub-Saharan Africa. You're not going to fix the poorest neighborhoods in America because we refuse to go in and tell the truth about why it doesn't work. And I think it's very important that we, that we have an honest debate about what policies will work. And there's no reason you can't have a system where 30 years from now virtually everybody on the planet has a good income, lives in a, a good neighborhood, lives in physical safety, uh, and, ha and sees their children and grandchildren having an even better future. But that requires fundamental change in the psychological attitude of people who look at these issues and refuse to look at the data. Yes, sir. One more question. We'd like to take a, a question from one of our off-campus students. Ah. And um, as you said, many of the talented people from several countries, including Canada, the UK, Russia, China, and India, dream to migrate to the US. Uh, do you think the U.S. may not attract these individuals in the future due to recent security and immigration issues? And what impact will this have on the U.S. in terms of the scientific revolution? Well, uh, that's a great question. Let me say, first of all, it, and I was just literally writing a chapter this morning in, in the book, uh, Real Change will come out in January, and the chapter was on immigration. And, and this is an example of why I, I guess I get so frustrated with the current political debate and the current dialogue in this country. The American people are not anti-immigration. The American people are overwhelmingly for legal immigration. We now have a government so stupid, so stunningly badly run, that we have invented a visa system. We, I don't know how many of you talked to people who've tried to come to the U.S. and had to apply for a visa. It is such an insulting, irritating, humiliating process that London may pass New York as the financial center of the world because wealthy people don't want to come to the U.S. That's, I mean, we, we had a good friend uh, recently, uh, a physicist from the, Russia, who has been coming to the U.S. since 1971, was an aide to Gorbachev, who spent four months 
getting a visitor's visa out of the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and said it was the most disgustingly irritating thing he'd been through and, it was, and he loves America and he wants to be pro-American and it was infuriating. I'd be very curious, I'll bet there are 50 examples here at the university of either students or faculty or visiting lecturers where it's just infuriating. Now, we don't have to have a government that is just deliberately stupid. I mean, I know this is a bold thing to say, so let, let me repeat it. <laughs> when, when the government is being stupid, we should change it. And I know this is radicalism. But, and if you get a chance, go look at FedEx versus federal bureaucracy and you'll see what I'm describing. But the question that was asked is really important. By the way, it turns out 65% of the American people want to increase the number of H-1 visas. I'm trying to help launch an H-1, H-2 visa association of everybody who came to the U.S. On those, on those visas because I want to network together everybody who's come to the U.S. and who's been very successful and who's created jobs and created wealth because I want to make a simple argument with the American people, which is if the person trying to come here has scientific and technical knowledge and entrepreneurial knowledge and they're going to make us richer, why would you, uh, what, what level do you want to cap getting richer? You know, is 100 people a year making you richer okay, or would you like to have more people making you richer? I mean, you think about the logic of the question, we should have an economically driven H1, H2 visa program. Because the truth is, I, I'm, the, I don't know how many of you remember the story of the, of the golden, the geese that laid the golden eggs, but we live in a world where geese can fly. So if we decide we're not going to allow the next really bright Indian software writer to work in California, that doesn't mean they're going to be unemployed. It means they're going to be in Vancouver, Canada, or they're going to be near New Delhi, or they're going to be somewhere else, but they're going to be doing just fine. All we're deciding is they're not going to be creating wealth in the U.S. So I, I am for legal immigration. I am for absolute control of the border. I am for a worker identity card that enables us to know every single foreign worker and where they've come and use a biometric to be able to identify them. But I'm for outsourcing that to American Express or Visa or MasterCard so it's run by somebody who can actually do it. And I'm for fundamentally replacing the current visa system for visiting the U.S. to get a system which is accurate, real-time, and I'll, I'll close this, but, but I want to give you this last example. How many of you have ever gotten money out of an automatic teller machine outside the U.S.? Okay, so this is not a theory, right? I want you to think about this in terms of why I'm so harsh about the government. You can go worldwide, put a plastic card in an anonymous machine, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The machine lights up with multiple languages. You pick the one you're good at. You put in a four number code, the machine reaches out 7,406 miles to find your bank, verifies who you are, validates you have the money, translates it at a slightly bad exchange rate, but better than your hotel. And the whole process takes 11 seconds. Is that about right? Now, in a world where that can be done worldwide, the fact that the US government could not invent a simple, repeatable, easily usable, highly verified visa system that made it both secure for America and convenient for our visitors tells you everything you need to know about the need to have fundamental, and this is not about Bush, and it's not about Democrats, it's not about Republicans. The current system by which we run ourselves is so broken that until we're prepared to fundamentally replace it with dramatically better mechanisms, we are not going to succeed. And the challenge for your generation is twofold. It is first in the private sector to invent the future. It is second in the public sector to bring your own government into that future. And those are the two great challenges of your generation. If you do it, we will be the leading country on the planet a century from now. The planet will be relatively free, relatively prosperous, and relatively safe. And we will have a human race which is poised for an extraordinary future of great adventure across the galaxy. And it won't just be one of those fancy things on television. It will be literally what's happening to us uh, as we go out and as we continue to spread freedom across the planet. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.